Well, let me start by saying that we are just delighted to be here and that Jean and I feel greatly honored to have been invited out here to share in this three-day or two-and-a-half-day silence a day, a commemoration with you all. There's so much about this getting together that reminds me of various periods of sahavas or getting together with Meher Baba, both in India and in America. I recall one occasion, for example, in 1954 when some 900 men were invited by Baba to come for two days. And uh, a great pandal had been erected at Lower Mahirabad, and many cots had been set up. They were just all right side by side. Big uh, fireplaces had been prepared, and uh, all sorts of things to make it convenient for some 900 men who were like camping out there. And uh, at the last minute, it started to rain. <laughs> and it poured. And we say cats and dogs when it rains hard. But uh, they call it an elephant rain. And it rained so hard that uh, the stone wall around uh, the retreat at the top of the hill was uh, damaged by the rain. Part of it was washed away, broke down after years of standing there. And uh, so, in greeting the 900 men who had come, many from great distances, at great sacrifice to be there, Baba acknowledged to them how much he appreciated their love for him and the sacrifices they made to come for that period, for just the two days. And he said that many pilgrims going on a pilgrimage to some shrine in India or elsewhere often have to undergo great hardships, suffer ordeals, and it's a part of their pilgrimage. The hardships and ordeals are not equally divided. Um, and I know that a similar thing has taken place here, that many of you have had to go through a great struggle to get here, come great distances and made great sacrifices. You felt, as we do, I'm sure, that this is something special, It is like a Sahavas with the Beloved. And in our Silence Day attitude, which is one of inner silencing of many of the voices of the world and of Maya, we can draw closer to him and shed perhaps many of the burdens that Maya has tried to place upon us and get some greater clarity of perception, some more clear sign of direction, and hopefully some lifting up of the heart. I'd like to read just a very few uh, quotations, not, not a lot, just a few, about Baba's silence. 
Baba said, the silence which I have been observing for the past many years is a call from the silence of the unfathomable divinity. The silence itself, his silence, is a call from the unfathomable divinity. Invite the divinity into your hearts so that you may become permanently established in the immortality of universal life which is vastly different from the persistence of limited individual life. The ego life has a beginning and an end. The truth which I bring is beginningless and endless. In order to inherit that truth, you need the courage to jump across the abyss of duality. And when we would come to him in Sahavas, he would say, come prepared to receive not so much of my words, but of my silence. Things that are real are given and received in silence. Drown all sound in my silence if you would hear my word of silence, or my word of words. This time of your being with me, I do not intend giving you a lot of words to exercise your minds. I want your minds to sleep so that your hearts may awaken to my love. You have had enough words. I have had enough words. It is not through words that I give what I have to give. In the silence of your perfect surrender, my love, which is always silent, can flow to you, to be yours always, to keep and to share with those who seek me. When the word of my love breaks out of its silence and speaks in your hearts, telling you who I really am, you will know that that is the real word you have been always longing to hear. For ages, I have been giving in silence my silent message of love. You ask me for a message from my silence, but silent are the words of my silence. Silence, silent is love, and the lover loves my silence, and silently adores me in my silence. I think from the very first time I read or heard of Baba, his silence was mentioned, and of course in connection with his silence, the breaking of his silence and the giving of the word. I'd never heard of such a thing. Of course, very people, few people had. <laughs> but it intrigued me and it um, struck a deep note deep within. It, it, of course, was a dramatic thing, but it seemed tremendously significant. I would have been attracted to him whether he was silent or not, as many would. But there was something about his silence and the breaking of his silence that had a special attraction. As a matter of fact, in 1932, when we first came into the, shall I say, orbit of Meher Baba, uh, he was on his way uh, through New York and uh, on to California, and he was going to break his silence out here. He was to go to China and then return and break his silence. And we were, Gene and I, a young couple at the time with a small, very small baby boy, 
and uh, we were quite uh, poor, and we had an old jalopy, and uh, we, st we were all ready to start out. California or bust. <laughs> we probably would have busted. <laughs> but uh, we were just about to give up our small apartment, and uh, we had already packed our things, most of them in the car, and we were just ready to start out. And fortunately, through Baba's timing, uh, we received, was it a telegram? that uh, Baba was not going to return to California to break his silence. And of course we were greatly disappointed, but uh, we did cancel our trip out there. And subsequently through the years, as you well know, Baba would give dates and build up our enthusiasm about the breaking of his silence. And it gave us lots of food for thought and wonder and uh, trying to fathom the significance of this great thing. But as the years rolled on and uh, silence-breaking days passed by, <laughs> <laughs> we began to realize that it didn't really make that much difference to us because he was giving us so much anyway. We felt that he was really giving us as much as he wanted to give us. We felt his grace and his love and his beauty, his inner guidance, and we felt secure in him. So I guess we realized that uh, our fate did not hang upon his breaking the silence in the verbal way. And after a while we realized too that he had broken his silence to us by awakening our hearts with his love. Of course, this is a controversial subject, and there could be many correct answers to the enigma of Baba's silence and the breaking of his silence. But one of them which I like is that God is love, the ocean, the infinite ocean of love, and what other message could love convey other than love? And to awaken the heart with love, to open the heart, to enable the individual to love. What greater message to inspire through love the function of love. So, in celebrating or commemorating Mayor Baba's Silence Day, we are also celebrating the advent of divine love. For many in a very dramatic way, for others in a casual, almost casual way, they heard sort of vaguely about this Baba, this Mayor Baba, and uh, after a while they saw a picture maybe, and something kind of got to them a little bit. And uh, then something happened <laughs> within. We're constantly being amazed by the way that Baba himself does his own work, the way he reaches people, touches them, and gradually attracts them to himself. He seems to do it in a way so that people of any walk of life 
going at whatever pace they choose, feel comfortable with him. They, they find that even though great, great things are said about him and are claimed about him, somehow they seem to feel comfortable with him. They've discovered that he has come to them at their level. Whether they be old or young, whether they understand much or little, no matter what or where they are, they've discovered that he has come to them at their level and that they feel comfortable with him. They can be inwardly relaxed with him. And a great new area of existence has begun to open up within them. An area which can lead to the experience of great beauty, a new rhythm of inner peace and Baba's own love on a sustained basis and freedom from many things and they would have different meanings for different individuals. My own experiences with Baba go back to a Christian background. Although I'd never joined a church, I'd been brought up in the Christian faith and had dreamed, hoped for, and believed in the second coming of Christ. and came to feel that in this very age in which we live, this would happen. A deep intuitive feeling, a knowing. And of course it did happen. And from this vantage point, I see it as one aspect, a long aspect in terms of years, of an unending, an, unbegin an, an, an event which had no beginning and has no ending. I see our relationship with Baba as an overall thing now that includes being with him in the spirit through a sense of Christ, through a sense of God, the infinite, through that phase of his coming into our midst and adjusting to the almost incredible experiences of being with him in the physical and in the spirit at the same time. And through the anguish of his suffering, and the dropping of his body and finding him again at the level of the spirit more intensely as the passing years go by as really the timeless one, the same divine beloved through the midst of it all. Infinitely patient working with me, with everyone, leading us toward a shedding of unimportant things, toward a growing, toward a maturing of consciousness, toward an awakening.
We did, of course, experience fantastic things in Baba's physical presence. Not because we deserved it or had earned anything. I often wonder how come we were so blessed. I think Baba had some work for us to do later on. <laughs> he wanted us to share, to, to bring to others. He would always say when we were with him, tell the others back home what you experienced. Share with them so they will feel that they too were here. Our first meetings with Baba happened in New York City. And it can be a shock, a deep, unexpected shock to come into the presence of divine love. Of course, Baba knew this. And fortunately, I suppose for us, he veiled himself very much so, he said, though we weren't aware so much of the veils as of his love. But to come into the presence of incarnate divine love is to come into the presence of consummate beauty. Unimaginable freedom and strength and purity and a sense of the infinite timelessness, the unlimitedness. We found that one cannot come into the physical presence of such a one and remain the same. You could walk into a room and see a picture and uh, be objecti objective about it, and uh, be all together as you were when you came in the room, when you leave the room. But this didn't happen around Baba. The moment you came into his presence, something began to give. <laughs> something began to happen. Uh, you began to feel a change immediately. Uh, for me, a great, a great change. You see, we ordinarily live at a fairly shallow level, level of, our, of our potential. And we're sort of scattered. And we're seldom called upon to bring ourselves, our psychic resources, all together and focus on something. We seldom are confronted with anything that important, except during an emergency. And then suddenly we do, we, we arouse all of our forces and try to bring them together and, and rise to the occasion. Well, around Baba, this would happen. It, of course, wasn't an emergency, and it wasn't unpleasant. It, it was, of course, beyond any delightful adjective or superlative that I could muster up in which to express it. But it was always as though veils were suddenly removed. I don't think that, that I, or perhaps others, realize this at first. I find that I'm still struggling to understand, to assimilate, and uh, to be able to articulate the significance of the things that happened when we were with Baba in the physical. They, they could never be relegated to the past for me, because he was and is of the infinite and of the timeless. They too are, even the most trivial thing around him. A touch, the way he carried his head when he walked, the way his hair flowed back when he wore it long, his long stride, his hands, the way they hung free, not, not knotted up holding inner problems and 
and uh, no brow knit within her complexes. But there was a great inner freedom and every movement was like waves of beautiful love. Of course, babes in the woods, uh, like we were, uh, when we first met him, we actually, uh, like someone who enters the tavern, tavern um, I'll try to make a double play on words here. <laughs> Many familiar with the, the uh, symbolism of Hafiz and the Persian poets, uh, many who enter the tavern for the first time don't know their capacity and become intoxicated. <laughs> and this is what happened to us. We, of course, were, we found Baba irresistible. We, we, we couldn't let a single second escape without our being near him and looking at him and bathing in the presence of his love. And so we got intoxicated. <laughs> By that I mean, in some ways we did, we did act like intoxicated people. When we get out on the street, a couple of grown people, arm in arm, skipping along the streets, singing. <laughs> And, uh, of course, this was the beginning of our experiences. One of our first 15-minute periods with Baba in New York, I shall never forget. It was a, a sunny afternoon, but it was in December, and his apartment was high up in a hotel room, and the sun poured through, but there was an exceptionally bright glow there. I guess it took me a long while to realize where that exceptional glow was coming from. <laughs> and, uh, but it was a glow, I would go beyond the word glow and say it was a glorious atmosphere. You see, I came to Baba as one goes to Christ. And he responded, to my heart's longing, and revealed a little bit of himself. He was just so beautiful. And there were four of us who came in to see him. And uh, two of them sat on one side of him and one on the other. And uh, I just couldn't resist kneeling in front of Baba and sitting back on my heels and looking up at him. And he gave us little messages. He certainly was well aware of our love, our feeling for him. And love welled out from him. We had no intellectual questions. And of course he knew this. Of course now we know that he had been drawing us for years to that very moment, preparing us for that very moment. And it was so beautiful, I thought, gee, wouldn't it be wonderful if he would give us some little thing as a memento for this occasion? And instantly he snapped his fingers and motioned to Chanji to bring a rose. And when he had the rose, he broke off a petal and handed the petal to each one of us, each one a petal, with the comment, Keep this as a memento of this occasion. Mm -hmm. 
<laughs> well, through the years, we found that he could and did respond to our thoughts, our dilemmas, our needs, that we could trust our inner contact with him, that it was real, as yours is real, and that you can trust it. And you can depend on him. He never did things for show, but simply to convey to us a little lesson. His foot was kind of dangling in front of me. He had his legs crossed. <laughs> and it was very beautiful. And I thought, when will I ever be in the presence of Christ again? and possibly have a chance to kiss his foot. So I looked, and no one was looking. No one seemed to be paying any attention. <laughs> now I know, of course, that Baba did that. He knew my thought, my wish, and he preoccupied them. No one else saw it when I kissed his foot. He could do that. He could make it possible. And he would do that. No one else knew about it. <laughs> now everybody knows. <laughs> <laughs> Other things happened which are very, very precious to me. I can seldom talk about them. And they happened to others as well, equally precious, equally wonderful and beautiful. And one felt, as you, many of you have felt, will feel, that he knows your love for him, your longing, your needs, and that he responds to you with his love, his dear love. That he embraces you in his own heart. Baba wants us to get beyond duality, but I find myself trapped in this aspect of duality called time. <laughs> uh, so I'm going to jump around a little bit. And uh, let's make a quick trip to India. Uh, it was my first one, of which I thought uh, began in 1954. Of course, I know now that it began long before that, and long before that, and long before that. <laughs> so that there really was no beginning. And it is that way with all of us. Uh, we have been in the heart of the Divine Beloved always. And he has always been drawing us toward himself, toward the truth, toward freedom. But we had to go through the evolutionary struggle, and we will have to go through the involutionary travail. <laughs> but with his help, and with an increasing sense of his presence, and his strength. To have received an invitation to come to be his guest in India was simply unimaginable. But after all those years, it had come to pass. And moreover, I had the wherewith to make the trip. And I realized that Baba had been arranging this right along. <laughs> and I think he had something to do with airplanes flying all the way uh, from America to India. 
so that one could get there at that time in 48 hours, and of course the time has been greatly reduced. Um, my trip actually started several months before the physical trip began. Those of you who have been to India have probably had the same experience. Once you you, you set your course for, for India, for Meherabad, something goes there, and you have to try to catch up with it. <laughs> it has already gone there, and you, you've already begun your trip. Well, this is the way it was with me. And it, it was a longing, and a looking inwardly forward to, to coming to him, to being there, overcoming all obstacles, and there were many on the ways that developed, but uh, finally getting there, and arriving at Maharabad Hill at 10 o'clock at night, Baba wasn't there. He was over at Meherazad, some 12 miles away. And we were told we would have a little while to look around before retiring for the night because uh, we should retire early. A, bu a busy day was due on the following day. So, I don't know, I suppose I'm a bit on the sensitive side to these things because I began to feel Baba's presence so intensely. It was it was as though it was hitting me here and hitting me there and bouncing and it seemed to be coming from the ground and by the building itself it seemed to be bouncing off the building and it reminded me of a stone building which has been exposed to the heat of the late afternoon sun and even after the sun has gone down the heat of the sun still radiates from that stone building well this stone building was radiating Baba, his presence, his love. And I was reminded of a passage from the New Testament wherein some of the disciples of Jesus mentioned to him that people were calling out about him and telling others about him as he was riding into Jerusalem. And he said, that's all right. If they had not done so, the very stones would have cried out. And I said, this is what's happening. The very stones are crying out. <laughs> They were crying out. And the following day was an, actually an overwhelming day for me. It was what was called Baba's last mass darshan program. It was held in Wadia Park on the outskirts of the sprawling village, which is a city really, of Ahmed Nagar in, um, near Meherabad. And a great Pandal, or tent-like structure, had been erected. And uh, thousands of people were there already, and thousands more were pouring along roadways and paths, many walking, many riding bicycles, some coming in cars. There were lame people, young people, old people, women with babes in arms. And uh, there was one man who even came on an elephant. <laughs> And uh, we Westerners, there were 18 of us, were led to the platform and told that Baba wanted us to sit there, cross-legged, Indian fashion. And there was a, uh, an Indian musical group uh, sitting down below on our left. And we, there was a PA system. And of course, this music was going on. And the whole scene was very, very colorful and just dripping with significance, even before Baba arrived. And uh, there was a big chair, a big comfortable chair there placed for Baba and a carpet in front. And Baba arrived at about nine o'clock. And before coming up on the platform, he washed the feet of and bowed down to seven poor men. You know, he would often do that. Not only poor people, but lepers. He would wash the feet and bow down and touch his head to the feet of lepers. And he called them beautiful birds in a limited cage, like beautiful birds in a limiting cage. And after washing the feet of the poor men, he gave them all 51 rupees. 
but not as poor men, as a gift from God to God. He evoked the higher qualities in his contacts with individuals. He evoked that from the individual. He called it forth. They were not poor men to Baba. They were souls. They had not to feel the inferiority of being poor. Nor do we have to feel the inferiority and all the other complexes that confront us in our struggle with this illusory world and what it throws at us. He then strode over onto the platform, look, looking so dynamic, so beautiful. And he was really sparkling and brilliantly sparkling. And his eyes were flashing. And he just glanced over in our direction and threw us one of those beautiful glances, you know, just sparkling glance, you know, and uh, each one of us. And the whole atmosphere began to pick up, to, be, to, to rise, you know. Things began to happen right away. And uh, there were some little ceremonies, uh, some girls singing his arti and some speeches. But then after that, Baba, who comes down to the level of every man, strode over to the front of the platform and prostrated himself a full length on the platform in front of that great mass of people. And when he got up, he was using the board yet, and Adi read the board, or Erich read the board, and he said, in order to save you the trouble of bowing down to me, I bow down to you. And then he walked down the steps and sat with first the women and girls and then with the men and boys and came back on the platform and said, in order to help you to understand and feel that I am one of you and one with you, I have come down to sit with you. And then the darshan program began. And that was a spectacle beyond describing. Baba took off his coat and rolled up his sleeves, and we were in for a day so in, almost incredible, well, I don't know whether I should use the word almost, um, I'm not sure I can believe it yet after all this time, uh, so many things happened. And Baba went and sat on the edge of the platform with his feet dangling, and great queues of people formed, and First, the women and children came, uh, women and girls and babes before him, and then a line of the men and boys, each receiving a handful of sweets and a pat from Baba, his love or his embrace, some contact. And divine love was beginning to function. And as I say, the atmosphere was, was picking up. And I know for me, I, I can't speak for others, they certainly can speak for themselves, and you probably have heard their stories as well. But for me, uh, it became, after watching this, hour after hour, I realized something far greater than what I see is happening here. One could sense the flow of love, the rising of the inner atmosphere of feeling, of beauty, of wonder, my great wonder, deepened into amazement. And a sort of a deep shock, if I may use that term. I can understand how, if Baba were not veiled, one would lose consciousness. To have been exposed to a full day of divine love in action. It was so great a, a, a blow to the 
surface structure of consciousness that uh, at least for me there is still a deep sense of beatific shock and I still have not assimilated that day that love was so great near Baba that I wondered well how you know how is it way out because people were trying to get near to Baba in fact there was, he was so magnetic that uh, several times large groups of men would get up and, and try to rush the platform. They would start to rush forward, sort of like a, 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 an instinctive thing. What they would have done if they got up there, I don't know. What could they do? Would they have eaten them up? <laughs> I don't know. But uh, there was just this, they had to get to him. There was this feeling around Baba that you had to get to him, to be near him. And uh, <clears throat> so I thought, well, how far out does this love go? So I got up and I walked way out around this great pandal. It was just as strong way out there <laughs> as it was near the platform. <clears throat> and of course, now I realize <clears throat> that on that day, Baba was doing a great work throughout. <clears throat> the entire world, perhaps the entire universes, I have no idea. But having a little better understanding and insight into the inner workings, I realize now that that was the outer symbol of a great inner working that was going on. Perhaps many of you who are young were being attracted to planet Earth at that time, to benefit from the ad advent of the Avatar. Because this is what happens when the Avatar comes. Though we may have lived on other planets, we're eventually destined to come to this planet or a similar one when this wears out, and that will happen eventually, he says, to begin the evolutionary path, to find, and that means the path of love. Everyone is in search of love, consciously or unconsciously, because pure love is synonymous with truth. Pure love is synonymous with freedom. Pure love is synonymous with salvation redemption, with grace, with infinite beauty. And he has come to give us this. It's such a curious thing. The seeker in search for the beloved himself becomes the beloved for whom the Divine Beloved searches and seeks. He is seeking us, drawing us, wanting to open up our hearts, wanting to, to, to share the treasures of the Kingdom of Reality, of Heaven, with us, here and now, and these things are possible here and now. We don't have to wait until we drop the body. We are meant to begin to experience some aspects of the reality here and now. Because in reality we are spirit, we are not body. He knows that we have been tyrannized by body identification and by Maya's tools of the opposites. And he has come to free us from this kind of Mayavic tyranny, to free our hearts, to help us to know that we are spirit, that we are not subject to birth and death, because he takes us beyond life, and he takes us beyond death. 
and we find strength which we never knew we had in him and we dare to do things which we never thought we would dare to do and he has always said you are capable of much more than you realize don't hold back try do your best and I will help you so when we are confronted with the impossible journey of the soul toward God don't say oh it's just too much and hold back dare to try dare to have faith that you can and that he will help you we are meant to experience inner freedom to be liberated from the baser impulses and tendencies and instincts through his love and truth you will find as many of us have found and I'm sure many of you have that you do grow in strength and that you do dare to assert the truth in the face of Maya you do dare to surrender the faults he, said, he told us that when Jesus told his disciples to sell all and follow him he didn't mean it so much literally but it meant surrender your limitations give up your limitations so that you can be free I'd like to tell you another little story. While in India in 1954, so many wonderful things happened that to me were like living pages of the New Testament. Unbelievable. I, I would feel like pinching myself and say, how, how could this be happening? But it was happening. And I also thought, this is an unbelievable opportunity to surrender all, to give all, to, to try to give everything to Baba. So I was trying to do that. Not realizing at the time that Baba himself had precipitated the whole thing. <laughs> <clears throat> and I after a while came to a dead end I couldn't go any farther couldn't do anything more and still not realizing that Baba was directing the whole thing and that he uh, our very lives with him meant that he was intervening and that he would intervene in this but it didn't occur to me that he would but a day or so later uh, still in this dilemma of having gone as far as I could in surrendering everything but run into a block one day he was standing nearby and without any ceremony ritual and apparently without even looking at me but he knew that I knew <laughs> he released he released what to me was a great a great flood but to him it was probably a tiny drop but uh, from my position it seemed like a great a great wall a great wave a great wave is the word I mean of divine love which swept from him to me and through me and just carried all of that away just like that and it wasn't until then that I realized that the very thing I was trying to get rid of and struggling with I was holding on to holding on to it and as it was being swept away I was still trying to hold on to it <laughs> sounds ridiculous but in the face of his love it was 
simply swept away. So I knew from that, and of course many other experiences with Baba, that nothing can stand in the way of his love. He can easily, effortlessly sweep anything away. If I had the time, I could tell you many other stories. So the result was that I became blissfully free and happy. And in trying to assess what had happened, I realized that I was experiencing the 23rd Psalm. And I said to myself, He restoreth my soul. I felt restored to wholeness. And I have had this experience with Baba, as many others have, and I'm sure many of you have and or will, of being restored to wholeness. We are already complete within, but somehow we need a little help, a lot of help, <laughs> to be restored to wholeness. And when we are restored to wholeness, he has done what we could not do. We've been trying to leap that chasm, across that chasm of duality. And he has suddenly, effortlessly, taken us across that chasm. And we find that we are no longer concerned about the past, which we've been dragging along, or the future into which everything is going to happen because it has suddenly happened now. And many aspects of the opposites suddenly fall away and we're no longer concerned about them. They no longer matter. They seem to function and we're, in, we're at the level of opposites and that's where they have their play of duality. Gain and loss, beginning and end, inferiority complex, superiority complex. We really are nothing anyway. and. Uh, all of these opposites which tyrannize us. But suddenly, when Baba, through an act of his divine compassion and grace, restores us to a glimpse of completeness, we know that all of this doesn't matter, that it really is myopic, illusory. And the heart is functioning in a giving. Baba makes it possible for the heart to function in loving. Love is a giving, a giving of oneself. Not on special occasions. All the time. It is a current, and it is his current, somehow commingled with ours. But it is a giving, and this giving is a releasing and a freeing, a melting, because we become fluidic. We no longer think we have to be something that's crystallized and solid. We don't mind being fluidic. We don't think we have to hold it. We know it will flow through, it will continue to flow. With Baba, he gave us experiences, beautiful, wonderful experiences, not to, uh, not to give us a state of spiritual advancement, but to give us uh, an experience to encourage us to make the effort to sustain what he had given us and what he will give each one of us. Now, what do I mean by that? He gave us tastes of freedom, of floating and swimming in this ocean of love. But after we would leave him, we would, out of habit, take on our burdens again, our complexes and uh, our struggles and 
because uh, we have become so in the habit of living with them and struggling with them. It, it's going to be a job to let go of all this stuff and be free. <laughs> but it can happen. And these were what these glimpses were for. As much as to say, because it wasn't a teaching, it was, here it is, here's the experience of it. So why are you bothering with all that other stuff? <laughs> Uh, but we would still go back and bother with all that other stuff, you see. But little by little, as we grow and begin to understand more and more, we realize that we don't really have to bother with all that other stuff anyway, do we? <laughs> and we can actually be more peaceful and have more freedom, really much more happiness and joy. And the things that we have, will have shed will be replaced by finer and much more beautiful, wonderful things. It isn't that we go into a vacuum like the misunderstood Western interpretation of nirvana, but that we become aware of, of much more beautiful things, of much greater freedom, of much greater fulfillment we know that through His love and grace we experience salvation. We know that we are of the Spirit and that we are sustained through His love and grace. And we couldn't possibly ask for anything more. And it's exactly nine o'clock. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, at this point, I'm supposed to ask you if you'd like to ask some questions. Dharma, <laughs> so what year was it when you first uh, met Father? The first physical meeting took place in 1934. But he did come to me in the spirit, and Jean had a similar experience in 1932. I had a couple of very vivid experiences of him coming to me in the spirit in 1932. Um, but of course, when we first met him physically, one of the things he said to us was, I have always been helping you. <laughs> always. <laughs> Long time. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? Just another 15 minutes with another good start. Are you for that? Yes. Good? Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, um, one time uh, in, Meher in Meherabad, Well, let me preface that by saying that during our stay there, Baba had been putting us through a, a, a great ordeal. He'd, one of the things he'd, he'd uh, told us that was that he would be dropping his body in a tragic way within a very few months. And this was a part of his inner working. And I know that I asked some of the Mandali if, this, if we should take this seriously. And uh, they said, we don't know. <laughs> but as consulting my own heart, I felt that Baba wanted us to take it seriously and to feel the, the, the anguish, the distress that all this involved. And so I took it seriously. But a question as a result of that came up in my mind and that was, when Baba drops his body, what happens to our relationship with him? Does he go off to some state of bliss? And do we lose contact with him? Or what happens? So this was a, a sort of an uppermost question in my mind, as uh, one morning we walked with him up the hill from Lower Meherabad, and as we crested the hill, he was so beautiful, and the atmosphere was so surcharged, with the Christ atmosphere, 
that uh, I know I was thinking that here again are living experiences of a new New Testament. And I know that I can't possibly convey the intensity, the, the unimaginable significance of the experience. But as this was going on in my mind, another thought crossed my mind, and I don't know why, it just popped, popped out. It was a phrase from the New Testament, uh, Jesus saying to some of his disciples, you all say, yes, yes, but you do not do the things I tell you. And Baba, who was off to my left, just shot a quick glance in my direction. <laughs> and uh, within a couple of minutes, we were in this big room where many of you have been at Maribad Hill, and we were sitting around in a big circle where we gathered and sat with Baba every day. And he started using the board, and he made a few comments. And then without looking at me, I was sitting way over on the opposite side of the room. He said, uh, I am the Ancient One. And when I drop my body, you all will love me more and more and see me as I really am. Wow, oh, that answers that question. <laughs> but not only for me, but for everyone, you see. Through loving him more and more, we will see him as he really is. So while I'm kind of reeling from that one, still not looking at me, kind of a bland expression on his face, he, he looks off to those side direction and says, you all say yes, yes, but you do not do. <laughs> and so then, in my confusion, I thought to myself, how can you fathom this being? And immediately, and still without looking at me, he said, I am so unfathomable that sometimes even I cannot fathom my own infinite being. <laughs> Then <laughs> sometimes, uh, some, I'm sure we all bothered Baba, as we do now. We, we pull on his coattails and say, Baba, I want this, I want that. When are you going to give me this? When are you going to give me that? And Baba would sometimes give us an illustration, which would take us maybe years, uh, me anyway, I'm a slow learner, to uh, understand. Like one time at the center in Myrtle Beach. Oh, this was a glorious day in May, May 17th, 1952. And it was a sort of an open house day, and Baba was seeing people at the barn. And he was sitting in there. I had, he, had, he himself had given me some duties outside. I was on the work crew, and I had duties to do, and I finished my duties, and, and uh, I was still on the outside. And Elizabeth Patterson was sitting there with Bob and John Bass, and uh, I don't know, maybe one or two others, and of course some of the Amandali. And uh, people were coming in to see Bob and having interviews with him, and, and going in one door and out the other. So many things happened there, and we'll probably talk about them at our reminiscing uh, period tomorrow afternoon. And uh, but I'm outside. And I'm, I'm just uh, crazy to get in there, you know, longing to be in there with Baba. Wow, gee, I just love to be in there with Baba. How come I'm out here? <laughs> and uh, so, after a while, someone came to the door, Darwin, Darwin, where's Darwin? Here, here, Baba wants you. Wow, and so I <laughs> come up to the door and walk in, and Baba is standing up there, and he smiles, and uh, he has this board, and he's... He motions me over, and so I come over to him, and he wags his head, and he smiles. And he has this board, and, and he could hold it between his fingers in some way and spin it, you know, casually spin it around. And so he did this, then he handed it to me. <laughs> and I took it, and I said, you want me to do that? Said, yeah. So, uh, <laughs> so I tried it, and of course I couldn't do it. And I handed it back to Baba. So he as much as said, well, too bad. Goodbye. <laughs> so I went back outside, and, and it took me a long time that, to realize that he was just getting me out of his hair. <laughs> and this is what we do. We're pulling on his coat strings, and we're saying, you know, as if he didn't know what he wanted to do with us. 
and didn't know what his timing was. Hey, Bobo, uh, when are you going to do this? When am I going to get that? When are, you know. <laughs> All we have to do is trust him. And he'll call us when he wants us. He'll, he'll open a door, a window, and give you what he wants to give. Well, that was another story. <laughs> I have five minutes more. <laughs> um, at one time in Sikori, Baba had taken us to Sikori. This was a beautiful day. And he wanted us to stay close to him when we would go with him places. Sometimes it was very difficult because of the pressure of the crowds. His close mandali would have to make a hand-to-hand -hand chain around him in order to keep the crowds from just uh, pressing in on Baba and uh, make it possible for him to walk alone. And on this occasion, this sort of thing was happening. And uh, many beautiful, very beautiful things happened, and one of them was when it came time for lunch. We were taken to this building, and we followed Baba in there, and all, I guess almost all of the Eastern Mandalay sat cross-legged on the ground floor. It was, a, it was paved, but I mean the, the, the lower level floor, and had their meal Indian fashion, eating with their hands off a leaf in their lap, you know, Indian fashion. And Baba led the way up a stairway with Godavari Mai, who was in charge of the ashram, a very wonderful person. And there, at an upper level, in a room up there, tables had been laid out in a big U-shaped uh, formation. And uh, we were told to sit there, and Baba sat at, sat at the head table with Godavari Mai, and we Westerners sat along the side. And uh, one of the uh, Sikori men sang a beautiful, like, hymn or arti to Baba. And suddenly it dawned on me, here is the scene of the Last Supper. Uh, I mean, it, it, of course, lots of people have eaten with Baba, but this was what struck me. The table, the setting, and here we are sitting around him, and there is the Beloved, the Christ. And after that, we were supposed to eat. <laughs> it was very difficult. But suddenly things would emerge like that. You'd suddenly realize something. It would pop out. On another occasion at Sakari, before leaving, we were supposed to bow down and kiss or, or touch our forehead to the tomb of Yupasni Maharaj. And at that time, I guess I hadn't quite gotten uh, completely adjusted to the idea that, that a perfect master is all right. You can bow down to him. It's, it's, it's perfectly all right. <laughs> you won't be breaking any rules. And uh, But I still had some um, old qualms about it, apparently, because as it almost came my turn to bow down, to the stone of the tomb, the thought passed my mind, have I come halfway around the world to bow down to strange gods? And Baba, who was several feet away from me, looked over my direction and with a smile on his face, quickly came to my side and as it came my turn, he put one hand on my forehead and another on my back and helped me to bow down. <laughs> <laughs> to his hand <laughs> so that it was his hand that touched the stone he knew very well I would have no objections to bowing down to his hand <laughs> how quickly he came to my assistance in my dilemma but with a smile and so gracefully and when I straightened up he smiled at me as much as say was that alright <laughs> <laughs> and uh, then he did the same thing to two or three others and smiled, you know, and, and no one realized what had taken place. <laughs> well, those were some of the things that would happen. And, um, of course, you all know that he had a great sense of humor. Uh, among the 
one of the things he said on the first days. He said that he would give us all 15 minutes to be with him alone. And that's another story. But he said in connection with this, I'll, I'll give you all 15 minutes to be with me for interviews. Even if it drives me crazy. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think that ever made the awakener. That was, <laughs> not that one. <laughs> so on that happy note, I'll say Jay Bob.